Pushkin. Today we have part two of Rick Rubin's conversation with proto-punk icon Iggy Pop. If you didn't catch part one last week where Iggy talked about his early days with the Stooges and the inspiration behind some of their most seminal songs, be sure to go check that out. On today's episode, you'll hear Iggy speak in-depth about the years he spent working and touring with David Bowie. He also explains how James Brown inspired his legendary performance style, and then recalls the ridiculous antics that led to him bleeding on stage for the very first time. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Rick Rubin with Iggy Pop. Why do you think the Stooges got popular over time? You know, there are probably a lot of good, uh, other good reasons that have to do with the work. But one thing might be this. It occurs to me, when something isn't pushed at you, the listener is allowed to find it for themselves. And something you found for yourself and you like, or your friend told you about it, maybe that has a lot more of a power, staying power, than something that this is a five-star review, <laughs> you know, or, or this is what's happening now, or this is what you can hear on the radio, whether you like it or not. Is it good enough? It better be because you're not going to hear anything else. All that sort of thing, it gets a quick result, but maybe it also kind of spoils something. So that might be one reason. And uh, the other reason I would just say is that the, the stuff has a good groove, the, it's the groove, I would say, and, and not too pushy. Uh, probably those reasons, and maybe also that it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit more fringe, and uh, maybe for some reason, in the new world, there's a larger space for fringe, for what used to be fringe. Mm-hmm. Everybody's the same size on the internet, but yeah. when uh, when when I used to go to record stores to especially the chains to buy something some people would be a card you walk in there's a cardboard cut out of the artist eight feet high (laughs) and some other artist you have to go to the back of the store and look through the stacks to find their stuff so there's there used to be uh more obvious differences i would say and we still have that we still have some artists that do a lot of uh, uh, numbers, you know, and others that don't. But for some reason, it seemed to be uh, ahead of its time. That's the old saw, I guess, but something about that, I, I don't know exactly. Could be. Maybe the world just caught up. Yeah, something, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. society kind of came halfway. and. So we know so many artists have been inspired by your onstage performance. Mm. Artists I've worked with, many artists, Mm. have have been inspired by you. Who were the artists that inspired you to do what you do in terms Mm. of the visual aspect of performance? James Brown, yeah, number one, first first and foremost. And then uh, I'm trying to think, uh, I mean, both Jim Morrison and Mick Jagger, when I started, those were two people that, would be wise to study, check out what they do, you know. Um, although at the time, Mick Jagger didn't do anything really particularly strange at first. There wasn't a pushy performance. When I first saw them, that was 1965. I, I was, they played Cobble Hall. I was still in, uh, in high school. And uh, it was Brian Jones was still in the band, and they just lined up in a row and uh, played, and there was, they all looked amazing, frankly, and uh, all looked really good. And Mick Jagger had a had a very large head, and uh, the movement comes from the head, really. But that was that. It was just a great visual. And when I saw them again in '69. Then that was the tour with the, he wore the Leo sign, the black outfit and the yeah. American cardboard hat and all that. And that was full performance, which was, I could see a little bit of Tina Turner. Mm-hmm. I could see a little bit of, uh, well, 
quite a bit of Tina Turner and then some stuff of his own. Jim Morrison, that was a whole other ball game. This guy had benefited, I think, from a, he had a good quality college education in the UCLA Film School. So he was, he was a film major there. And uh, so he's singing, he's singing and things about, you know, with the, where the lyric is taken from uh, French uh, novelists 200 years ago. You know, it's from Céline at End of the Night and this sort of thing. And uh, he was doing, he was doing some movements that I'm sure he got straight off uh, the side of a Grecian urn, mm. you know, like, and trying to, trying to explore uh the the idea of theatrical badness, a la Antonin Artaud, that kind of thing. So um, that was interesting. But but with both these guys at the time, you're you're young, you're starting out. These were the two poles of what was interesting in in white rock, and what they both did well, they centered well. That's the main thing to her a vocalist. You know, I ran into you at um. Nine Inch Nails show in the forum mm-hmm. and we were sitting at the mix- mixing desk and I'd never seen him work and he just came right out at Mike and he centered and when, when somebody centers well they, they don't even have to move you know that whole energy comes into them back to the band out through them and uh, it acts like some sort of battery or something so that was that's what I got out of them, and with James Brown, it's oh, sure it's amazing to watch what he's doing and everything. But what's really behind it, what makes it click, from the moment he's getting ready, even before he steps out there, until he's gone from your sight, the concentration never ebbs. He never goes down to 90% while he reaches for a glass of water or anything. Oh, no, no, no. 100% at all time. Uh, it's a concentration. Uh, it resembles paranoia. Yeah. It's really, yeah. It's, he's really there, you know. And I used to love it. His, <laughs> in his, uh, his, one of his autobiographies, he would tell about uh, backstage, he would have a hairdresser because he wouldn't leave the backstage until his hair was perfectly quaffed again and no one could see him that way. And uh, he told the story once about how when they got, the band got to the point where he had a Cadillac, but they didn't have AC in it, and, or it was broken or something. And at some point, they, they had to travel down the road with all the windows of dying of asphyxiation so everybody would think they had the AC, you know. And he tells <laughs> another amazing. time about, yes, he tells it about another time when the same car broke down and he said, yeah, so I made the band get out and crouch down and push it but so nobody would see <laughs> and then jump in. <laughs> you know, all stuff like that, you know. Very, very full, full on, you know. Yeah. He has a Christmas song, one of his great Christmas songs, uh, and he gets to the end of you know some some homilies about Christmas and, and everything, and then he goes, "And be sure to come to my Christmas show." You know, he says, <laughs> "Sell that Christmas show and buy the Christmas record." And you know, yeah, he's working it. You know, did you ever get to see the Doors live? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was the big push. I, I saw them twice live, and the, and the first one was what pushed me into uh, getting on stage with the Stooges. I'd been trying to form the band, and we were living together and trying to get ideas for what we might do. And uh, the Doors, after their first album, came to the University of Michigan to play a homecoming dance in a basketball arena. Not even an arena like we have now, just a basketball place with some bleachers. Sort of like the scene in the Nirvana video, right? Okay, like that. And uh, there was just a little stage, you know, 18 inches high or something. They had uh, Jordan Boss amps and a column speakers instead of a PA. They did not have enough equipment to reach the room. 
and uh, they didn't know about that sort of thing yet. They were a weekend band coming out and playing on, on the weekends and then going back to L.A., but they had a, this big hit record. And uh, the band came kind of sauntered out without Morrison and started up the uh, the Riff to Soul Kitchen. It didn't really sound right because it just wasn't amplified in a way that you could grasp it. It was all right, I guess. And then he came out dressed in black vinyl, head to toe with a ruffled shirt. His hair was oiled and curled and down past his nipples. And his eyes were like saucers. He was obviously on a lot of probably LSD. Could have been psilocybin. And he sort of did this thing like Tina Turner might do or something like Mick Jagger might do where you, the arms go up like a chicken but his was a more drunken version and he didn't sing he just and the guys at this thing are like you know they're frat guys with their dates and they're starting to think what is this shit <laughs> you know and they're getting pissed off yeah. and then when he started to finally sing he sang Soul Kitchen in a falsetto <laughs> The clock says it's time. Yeah, in a falsetto. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then they started getting really bad. And uh, they put, you know, do things like you do if you're if you're drunk. He put his arm around Robbie Krieger and say, this is my man. This is my man. Look at the place of blues. You know, it's like, like a bad oh. drunk that was about oh to get 86 God. from a bar. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. So the, I was just fascinated. Yeah. You know, and I loved it. And I said, wow, you know, this guy is, this is quite a spectacle that he's getting away with this and uh and the the gig was they got through it a very short program and left basically and they, and they were kind of lucky not to get their butts kicked yeah it was a crew cut time still for most people then so i i thought well boy I could do that. <laughs> well, yes, exactly. I could do that. Yeah, the old I, I could, could do that. I could alienate yeah, people as I much as this guy. Yeah, <laughs> they hate yeah. him. I can. I could do. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's so exactly. Funny. What was the second time you saw them like? Ah, uh, that was different. They played uh, Cobble Hall in Detroit. Uh, it was either on their second or third album. It had a full house and a large you know, typical arena stage and beautifully amplified, everything really well separated and produced and he sounded great and they just went through their stuff and it sounded good, but he still took the effort to try to do something a little different. So at one time he sort of jumped off the stage and ran again, kind of uh, in a pre-Raphaelite way <laughs> up the whole center aisle of the arena to the back and then ran all the way back during an instrumental part. And then uh, later, after the show, Dave, uh, all the Stooges went, Dave, the bass player, said to me, yeah, I was walking, I was walking to the men's room and there's Jim Morrison walking around, you know, outside in the corridor. And he said, hi, you know, so he, he was like that. He had this concept, you know, he had this one lyric, um, American boy, American girl, most beautiful people in the world. That was a nice, nice sentiment, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think he had this, uh, I think he wanted to be a kid. And he would say, they, te they teach me how to live. So I think he wanted to be a kid forever mm -hmm. sort of thing. And that, there was something really, uh, really nice in that. I, I saw footage of his performances, and he was deliberate on stage. He'd be thinking, he'd been wanting to come up with something to get put some entertainment in here. But on the other hand, he would saunter across the stage just to move the mic stand or something. Okay, I'm moving a mic stand now, or whatever it is. What was the first time you ever bled on stage? That would have been the the second Stooges show. It was sort of my first stage dive, too. We were opening for Mothers of Invention at the ballroom. And uh, I was just at this point, it was like, if this group is going to survive, we have to do something every show 
to make sure not, nobody forgets us. <laughs> and so uh, I didn't feel the full connection was being made. And there were a couple of very healthy girls who were laying on their backs right at, in front of the stage watching the thing. And I thought, well, I'm just going to fall on top of them. That maybe that'll be exciting, and I, so I did that, and they separated, and I hit my teeth. I used to have these protuberant front teeth. I hit them on the on the floor, and I chipped one, and uh, one went through my my. You know, I cut a little cut in my lip and started to bleed a little. So that was that was the first time. Do you think if you were not in a band mm-hmm. and not performing? you would still, in regular life, put yourself in situations where you would end up bloody or beaten. That's interesting. I don't generally, I I don't have a very long history of being beaten by others, Uh, just a couple of times. So it's mostly, you know, it's mostly my own doing. Probably, I would say, if only because uh, my mother used to, my mother told me that, I think, and I remembered by the time I was six, I already had 12 or 15 stitches in my chin from running and falling over head first, headlong, that sort of thing. So so maybe that was just there in my fate, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I haven't bled in, uh, well, yeah, I had one on the last tour. I tripped (laughs) over something. Yeah, I bleed a lot less these days. Great. But, uh, but it, yeah, has, yeah, it, yeah. has it ever been intentional or it's always been accidental? It has been. It, there was a long period of time when I was just very uncomfortable with the relationship with the audience. It would be with if the relationship wasn't good and I had to keep going or, I, you know, here I am in the wrong town or the wrong place or whatever. And I would just kind of scratch, you know, and I wasn't scratching to make blood. I was just scratching, (laughs) you know. So that became kind of something that was present on and off for a long time that had to do with my nerves. Understood. Um, I don't have those problems anymore. Uh, But um, other times, like there was a fairly famous time when... uh, I got a big gash in Max's Kansas City, and that was just, I was on top of a table trying to get a rise out of a, look, you play Max's Kansas City at that time, it had become so celebrated that they put in rock shows, and if you were someone like us, like the Stooges at the time, the entire audience, it seemed, they were all critics. Mm-hmm. And they all had glasses on, and I could see the stage lights reflected in their glasses. They're all just kind of staring at us, right? They give you nothing mm-hmm. back. And so I got on top of a, a cocktail table to sing, trying to push things a little bit. And the table, I lost the balance of the table. The table went over, and I got cut on the stem of a broken margarita glass, but it was an accident. I didn't roll around in glass or anything. It was just an accident. One thing about me, if I get hurt or if I get cold or if I'm in the rain or whatever it is, I'm not going to stop. I don't do that. I'm I'm not going to go, sorry. Nah. So, you know, I just keep going. In that case, I kept going, and yeah. and and there there was blood was dripping. Okay, yeah. but I'm, okay. Oh, uh, wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen. While I take care, of, no, I'm no. doing the show. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're James Brown. <laughs> the show there you goes go. on. I'm it's ja- like it's I think I'm every James time. Brown. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the spirit of James Brown yes. has crept into my body. Yes, I understand. An English guy came, uh, who had the uh, Sir, God, Lord, somebody. He was a <laughs> Lord. Who, yeah, he had the show, South Bank show, a big arts show there. And he, he came to Miami to interview me. And he said, "Well, obviously you are possessed." <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. So there you go. You know. 
we talked a little bit about your relationship to music earlier. Would you say that music is different for you than other forms of art, or can you be as taken and moved by all kinds of great art? Painting is close. Painting, because it doesn't move, and it gives me more of a chance to go in. But it's not mo- not in the same, does not have the same drama for me or the same raw excitement, but it does have a powerful, powerful impact. And it can be anything from a, a primitive to a Francis Bacon to a, somebody contemporary even. Mm-hmm. Movies, I wish there was something great since the French New Wave, frankly, you know, less and less so with the films, I would say, you know, but I'm still interested. Mm -hmm. The one thing with the movies, what I used to do when I'd have trouble in my career, I would go to see a hero. So uh, I remember when I was between the first edition of The Stooges had fallen apart and I was trying to restart, do the second edition that would do the Raw Power. And I was in New York at that time when I eventually I hooked up. But in the meantime, I wanted to see Clint Eastwood. So I went to Times Square and I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it was just reassuring to watch a guy that could get the job done. And uh, years later, here in L.A., I was down and out, and I, I spent a few of my last dollars to see, uh, gosh, it was the, uh, again, it was Clint's, one of Clint's movies where uh, kind of a neo-Nazi gang has infiltrated the San Francisco Police Department. I can't remember the name of that one. And then later, there was another time, there was an Elvis movie on, and I walked, I was back at the trailer and uh, with my parents, uh, I was maybe in the early 20s and between between contracts, and I walked into town to see Harum Scarum, <laughs> which is a terrible movie where he's dressed up in he's dressed up like MC Hammer <laughs> before <laughs> MC Hammer and singing these crappy songs, but it was Elvis, you know. Yeah. So that there's something about that that I I like, you know. How do you find new music? I look in the. Uh, the smaller, the main source would be the smaller reviews in daily papers. Mm-hmm. The Guardian in England has a really, they, they're very thorough about all sorts of stuff. It'll be mentioned or reviewed in a short, a short way that's almost just like news uh, that it exists. And I listen to a lot of that. And then gig guides. I go through the gig guides and if I like the name of the band, like I went through the gig guide of a couple of years ago and there was this band, it was uh, in London, some playground and it's Joe and the Shit Boys. And I said, what? Well, that sounds cool. Who the fuck is, who are these people? And you know what? I listened to their music. They're a, a simple but effective well, they play well together, really cleverly thought out punk band. But it turns out at the time they build themselves as a vegan queer punk from the Faroe Islands. <laughs> right? So I just liked them and listened to their music. They have like songs like Macho Man, Randy Savage, Macho Man, <laughs> Randy Savage, right? And it's, it's entertaining and clever and they have a lot of good songs. So th- there was another one I found that way. There's a band, uh, it's basically two guys. I think they're probably Island Heritage in England called Bob Villain. V Y L A N. And uh, they've got some smashing good numbers. And that's more like a little more social protest. All this, the shit boys are social too. But I listen to everything. I listen to everything. I have a radio show on the BBC. And I, I have to come up with two hours, 40 weeks a year. So you come up, it's 1,200 songs. And I try not to repeat. Yeah. So I listen to a lot of new stuff. And I, I like it pretty wide selection and then sometimes if you use spotify then it leads you 
sometimes the algorithm is right. Well, I Uh do like this other thing you thought I would like, you know. Uh So I do it like that. And sometimes uh, I'll go to the music papers, too, Uh you know. But they tend to cluster around something that has to do with their advertisers or their backers or their particular thing. So it's not maybe not as fruitful for me, but I go there. Oh, and friends and friends. Oh, great. Yeah, I have sources. You know? And they send you stuff all the time. Yep. Check uh-huh. this out. Check I ask. This out. Can you send me more of that? Like, yeah, yeah you have a couple people in France who send me. Yeah. I especially like the francophone Afro beat stuff. is killer, and you, you, you need somebody French to steer you with that. Have you ever used the, um, what's the name of that? It's a French app, Radio Whoa, 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 Whoa. No, I don't know Radio Whoa, 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 Whoa. You'd like that. It's not new music, but it's really cool. It's a streaming service that shows you a a map of the world, a globe. And you can pick any country in the world. Yeah. And any decade. And it'll play music as if it's the radio playing in that country, like Morocco, 1950. What does that sound like? It's so cool. (laughs) You'll love Uh, it. Thank you. Just fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like radio. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're going to love it. Wow, cool. Tell me about the uh, the Electra album covers. So I feel like the, those album covers are some of the best album covers in the history of rock music. Mm. How did it happen? <laughs> well, the first one that we did was a guy named Joel Brodsky. And uh, the first Stooges album was uh, done at his studio and he had done the Doors albums so the the guy directing the art at Electra was also the general manager they used to double up in those days well uh, get Brodsky to do it but do something a little like the Doors you know so I had ten got ten stitches that day back to the blood because I was like, oh, this is I don't want to be just like the doors. This is gonna to be too boring. So how about there there are outtakes from that session that are around where the, the stooges are all crouching on the floor as I fly through the air over them. <laughs> and and he had a concrete floor and I <laughs> so we had to stop the session of they stitched me up and brought me back and we continued later in the afternoon. But uh that was that was how that one was done. And the funhouse cover, that is mainly the my part and the background of that is the that is the floor of the whiskey a go go in front of the stage. And we played it the whiskey as bands often do when you're fledgling you go somewhere to record and then the company says yeah how about a couple of dates to defray our expenses you know you play we'll take the money you know so we played the la and san francisco and at the whiskey i was sort of writhing around on the floor trying to get some action going <laughs> and there was a, a photographer there who was ed Cariff, a very groovy young guy you know and uh he shot the group in the studio and also at the whiskey and then collaged the things really nicely i thought so beautiful and gatefolds you know for just beautiful beautiful art yeah that's what i thought it was really really nice and uh we were all we were all young and fresh and excited to do it you know we all had a certain with the band had a a certain aesthetic you could see it uh that carried on later we wore we never really went deep into stage costumes. We stayed, it was like a, a certain area of normal clothes, but not quite normal, mm-hmm. cut a certain way. So when we started, you were telling the story, I, we, we ended up going back to talking about the Stooges, but when we started, the first thing we were talking about was how you met David, and you said that you joined the station to station to tour. Tell me how it worked out that you guys started working together, and how did it work out that the Stooges stopped and you started doing solo. Yeah, well, basically, after meeting him and uh, Tony DeFries in Maxis, Kansas City, uh, it, it was agreed that we'd go to England and make a record, but they really just wanted me to make the record. They didn't want to have anything to do with the Stooges. I talked them into the first one guy, and then let's get the Stooges. David offered 
to produce the record. I think that's what he really wanted to do. And I declined on the grounds that I already had a vision for what the band needed to do at this time, which I did, and what I wanted to make. And uh, I'm glad I did because when I got him later to work with me, his skills had taken a big jump. So around that same time when I declined the Stooges thing, he cut a single with Monta Hoople. And the way that works is he could write a better song than they could. So they put out all the young dudes. And then a guy like that who's moving right along in his career, you get the experience he's going to be done with you and wants to go do something else. So they he got them up to a certain point, and then they had to kind of carry on, mm-hmm. write another, all the young dudes, or forget it. So that was difficult for them. Uh, it wouldn't have been good for us. So we did that, and uh, there was Raw Power was actually finished before Ziggy Stardust was, but uh, they decided to put out Ziggy Stardust first, and uh, through various frustrations and the fact that even though it's a great record, it's not commercial in that way in those times, Raw Power kind of fizzled out, the band fizzled out, everything fizzled out, I fizzled out. Fast forward, there's a wonderful man named Freddie Sessler who was an extremely close friend and confidant of Keith Richards. Freddie looked and sounded like Chico Marx, and he was a survivor of Auschwitz. He had the stamp right on his arm, and he was a crazy rock and roll fan. Hey, talk like this, you know. (laughs) Hey, I like what you're doing. I'm going to come and see you. And Freddie was a guy who um, knew how to get out of any jail. Nobody really knew why. And he also had a lot of a certain substance that was always pure from the from the pharmaceutical companies so i got caught shoplifting once apples and cheese in the mayfair market in beverly hills and freddie bailed me out of jail and he said hey he listened you know David wants to see you. He, he, I want to go down to San Diego where his tour started. He, he wants to see you. And, uh, it would be great. And I said, oh, God, I don't want to bother him. You know? but he said, no, 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 it's going to be great. So he put us on the phone, and uh, David said, I, I, I've got a track that would be good for you. I think we could build something around that. Why don't you come down and listen to it? So I had nothing else going on, and and, uh, I liked what he was doing at the time. That was Station to Station. That's a great record, man. Cut it Cherokee in L.A. Uh So I went down there and uh, listened to what became Sister Midnight, listened to the backing track. So we started from there. He said, look, if you come across with us on this tour, by the time we get uh, done with Europe, we can make a record. So it was common in the... It still is. We worked under something called a production contract, which, and you know, generally the way that works is when a when a star becomes hot, it's easy for them to their management to go to the record company they're with and say, "How much will you give us for our star to produce something on this other artist through our own company?" And of course, the the parent company is gonna doesn't want the artist to start talking to any other company. They went, yeah, sure, we'll help you out with anything you want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the, he, I was signed to Bule Brothers for three albums and they sold that to RCA. And so we, we started work on it basically as we went across America. And uh, he was traveling by car it's the same car and driver that is in the Man That Fell to Earth wow. movie. Uh, Tony Massia is the guy's name. Tony was a wonderful man. He had done some time in Sing Sing for manslaughter. And uh, he was out. He's just a great guy from the Bronx. And uh, he was the, the driver minder. And uh, we would go by night in his car from city to city with one of these little plastic record players in the back. 
and uh, it was him and me and Tony and his uh, Coco Schwab, his PA. And uh, he was always had somebody sourcing him the newest interesting records from America and Europe. So the three that were in heavy rotation, actually, the, yeah, on that was um, Kraftwerk Radioactivity, their first Ramones album, and the Tom Waits album with Copper Penny on it, wow. that early one. Yeah, those three. I listened to those a lot. And um, the Kraftwerk made the biggest influence uh, on what we were about to do. And then at the end of it, we went in Arrow V and just started writing, sort of ping-ponging back and forth. That was creative and odd, mm -hmm. the whole thing. And, you know, China Girl was probably the best lyric I came up with on that. I was having an affair with a, somebody Vietnamese or, around the studio, but also the Chinese government was beginning to allow small Chinese official government shops were cropping up at that time around Europe where they sold Chinese rugs, mm. little figurines, the little red book, you know, all that sort of thing. And I thought, this is a coming culture. And so I was trying to sing a song about the two cultures meeting. And I sang this, the line, I'll give you television, you know, which is, but, um, Later, Bad Company was recording. They came in to start their record and uh, while we were ending ours and they heard me singing, I'll give you television through the window and they started mocking that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I did well with I'll give you television. <laughs> yeah. you know, an interesting, yeah, lyric. So uh, that was that one. And uh, Brian Eno visited there at that time to start the process that was going to lead to low. Mm -hmm. And both albums were done between Aravie in France and Music Box in Munich and then Hansa in Berlin. But um, that was that. And then the we did the tour after that where he played in the band. And, and uh, immediately at the end of the tour, we went right back in and the Lust for Life was more he'd had enough of the whole thing so we sat down and wrote the, the whole thing was written in about two days wow and it's literally yeah literally okay here's one i'm rewriting and i was recording them as i had on the fur i record his ideas on a phillips monoral cassette machine you know, weighed about 10 pounds and uh cost like 25 bucks you know and uh, i'd record the ideas and then uh come up with lyrics or a concept and uh that one went faster in the studio we were about two weeks kaboom kaboom kaboom, kaboom including mixing it, it seems like you figured out the i wouldn't call it a formula but you found a way to work together and you can you were continuing yeah. that process so you didn't have to there was less figuring it out and more just doing it exactly and and there was also you know there was a contractual side to it he had he would get a certain amount of money to deliver album two mm -hmm. and uh, i needed to have album two <laughs> and then eventually for album three we just did a live you know everybody he wanted to go his way i wanted to go mine and uh, that as is very normal mm -hmm. and happens you know did you guys remain friends for the rest of his his life yeah yeah and we've you know we, he would call and come and see this what about that and everything and we go out and you know or he'd bring uh he brought keith richard to my gig which was a thrill for me and i got to know keith and then he brought Mick jagger to one of my gigs and sat backstage and the singer's wearing no shirt he's wearing no shirt <laughs> <laughs> you know blah 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 you know and, and uh, stuff like that and then eventually we did one more album again about eight years later called blah 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 because he had heard i played him some demos we were swapping demos up at his digs at the carlisle hotel and i had uh I had demoed some stuff with Steve Jones, you know, a little, mm -hmm. a little home studio in L.A., and Steve was just newly sober and uh, interested in playing 
in ways he hadn't before. And I was interested in singing more in a baritone. So I, I had three or four good demos for Steve, and, and David heard those, and, well, we could make that, we could make a record out of that. And he wanted, he wanted to do it in Switzerland because uh, he had a residency requirement at that time. Mm -hmm. Steve couldn't leave the U.S. at that time. He didn't have the right visa together. So mm -hmm. we used Steve's tracks and Steve plays on the album just by use of the tracks. And it's an 808 drum machine and uh, Kevin Armstrong also on guitar. And uh, that was that was interesting. It was, we recorded at Montreux, that studio where everybody goes, mm -hmm. you know. And then uh, we stayed quite friendly and stayed in touch up through, up till about the beginning of the 90s. And then at some point, both people were on different trips and different wavelengths. But um, the last time I spoke to him, he, he called me up. I had gone to Miami, he called me up in 2002 or three. And uh, he was interested in signing me. He was going to start a new label. He didn't, didn't eventually at, at Columbia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to stay where I was. So I just stayed where I was. He talked to me about, he curated something called Meltdown. At one time, one year in London, the Meltdown Festival, and I ended up not doing it because I was busy doing other things. So it was, it was a, cordial, yeah. a cordial call. How long have you lived in Miami? Since the end of 98, so it's been about 24 years now. How has Miami changed over that period of time? Oh, well, what used to be was a large open space underpopulated, which was wonderful at the time. And uh, it drew a lot of quirky people, uh, which was just perfect for me, <laughs> you know. For instance, when I got there, there was a street in Miami Beach. It was 11th Street in between Collins and Washington. There was a storefront and Luke Skywalker from Two Life Crew had had Luke Records there, and that was the headquarters. And there was a large piece of what they call drywall yeah. in the front window, this picture window of a small, you know, a small shop window. And it was spray painted, a picture of a brown beauty in a tiny bikini with totally impossible curves, right? Seat, seated, smiling at you under a palm tree with giant coconuts and then Luke Records, you know? So there's things like that. Yeah. And uh, a lot of open space and breezes and a lot of rundown old buildings that had been the great hotels of the 50s. And I, originally when I was there, I, I got a condo in one of those I bought it from a character named Jonathan Shaw, which is the son of Artie Shaw, wow. and a great tattoo artist, and a man's man, a two-fisted, ride your motorcycle to Rio de Janeiro, you know, man, man kind of a guy. And uh, I bought it from him for 40 grand. And it had a hot plate. It was like an SRO, like an old man's single room occupancy yeah. apartment, but right there with a killer view of the beach, you right. know, and the beach. And yeah, wonderful, wonderful. And uh, I went from there. I, got, I bought a little house. I'd never, I'd never done that for myself before. Mm. And I went there with no manager, no roadie, no minder, just all alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, bought a little what they call a Venetian revival house. It's like a house you'd see in Corsica or something with the barrel vault right. tiles and the, the ceiling like with the, with the vaulting and the peaks and nice tile work. And uh, I was able to, I was calm enough, I was able to quit smoking. Great. You know, things, things that are very hard to do in New York City. And uh, I, I had never bought my own car. So I called a car dealership and they started to ask me these questions, you know, like, well, what is your job and who's the, the employer number and all this? And I was like, oh, this is not fun. So I hung up and I looked in the classifieds and I saw $5,000 
cherry red Cadillac <laughs> DeVille convertible 1967. Perfect. I said, that sounds like me. <laughs> and, you know, I go to the guy's house and, you know, he's like his big hairy guy who, you know, could be like a motorcycle cop or a, a pilot or something. And, and I, I said, well, this is, car is beautiful. I said, how does she run? And he dangled the keys in front of me and he said, she's ready to go to California right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and this is cool, you know. Yeah. So I, I bought that car and I drove that all around Miami right. and Miami Beach for for years. And uh, now the big money's there. So they're getting permits they've built up. There's more shade, less light, mm. more wind tunnels, less breeze, mm. like hard to park more dangerous it was always dangerous it's an edgy place you know but uh so that's just what it is but it's still for america there's a certain ease about the life there do you ever think about moving close by but not in miami just like you know an hour away in any direction and it's yeah more like what it used to be probably (laughs) i have a place an hour away by plane Mm -hmm. i'm in the the boondocks there nice I love that. You know, I don't know if I'd move to rural f- Florida or not because because there is no more rural Florida left, really. Mm-hmm. Everywhere that's nice, that's rural, they've built up and built over. It's, it's pretty bad. You'd have to move to the Everglades mm-hmm. pretty much, you know. There were still people, some people in the last hurricane that still had a couple of little idyllic communities there, and they lost them. It's Florida is a very fast growing state, especially since since Donald Trump changed the tax deduction laws. There's no deduction for state tax. So a lot of people from California and from New York to escape that and also to from New York to a lot of people came during COVID because these are people who had some wealth but suddenly they didn't want to take the elevator anymore. I understand that, you know, so you could come to Florida and get a little patch of land with, with your home. It's, it's growing. It's also more of an outdoor culture. I imagine you spend much more time outside there than in New York. Yes. That's why I went there. And, uh, I had visited in the seventies and I saw houses where the inside was out and the outside was in. There were lizards in the house. I loved that. <laughs> there are lizards in the house. They come and yeah. go, you know. Yeah. So I wanted, I told the realtor, I want to see something like that, <laughs> you know. Yeah. House yeah. with lizards, please. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> and I did. I got a house with lizards. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever imagine living back in Detroit or would that not be a thing you would do? I would if I didn't know anybody and nobody knew me, <laughs> that's what I'd say. But because of who I was a long time ago, what I went through, and whatever vestiges of that might still be there, I would not. Mm-hmm. You know, I would not. But otherwise, I would because Michigan people are cool. Yeah. The Michigan people are really great people. And uh, it's probably very inexpensive to live well. You know, and there's still there's still space. Do you think of Detroit as home, or do you think of Miami as home? Miami, yeah, yeah that's my home, and that's that. Cool. Yeah. Well, I feel like we could talk for probably another six hours, so maybe we do this again soon. Okay, cool. But I love talking to you, and I love learning about music. Talking, talking to you, it's great. All right. Cool. Hey, this was real nice, eh? Amazing. See you soon. Thanks again to Iggy Pop. You can hear all of our favorite Iggy and Stooges songs at brokenrecordpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Ben Holiday, and Eric Sandler. Our editor is Sophie Crane. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music is by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond.